Okay, good morning everyone. Well, my name is Gabriel and I work at CINT. CINT is a Brazilian company, which actually is a multinational company uh, focused in software delivery, digital uh, transformation, lean digital transformation. And we have a special group there called, called Cognitive Studios. I'm also uh, a PhD student at ITA, the Brazilian Aeronautic Institute of Technology. And basically, I, uh, I, I want to talk with you ab about the latest uh, research advances in recommender systems, especially using deep neural networks. Okay, so I hope uh, you can apply in your work and generalize these principles to other problems that some s are somehow similar. Well, uh, Chris Anderson, in the well-known book, The Long Tail, said that we are leaving the information age and entering the recommendation age. So now, instead of just uh, segmenting our customers, uh, with the digital tr transformation, the customers are, are empoderated. They want to be special. They want a personalized service. And companies are treating not, not then uh, just as cluster or segments, but as millions of ones. So we are now uh, in the personalization age. And we all know, maybe this is the most popular machine learning application for the broad audience, because everyone uses uh, uh, news portals, use e-commerce portals like Amazon, uh, services, uh, entertainment services like Netflix, and streaming like Pandora and Spotify. So we all know that the power that personalization brings to the, for the user's engagement. And of course, companies are looking to, to earn more, to increase their profits and their fidelity and reduce churns by means of recommender systems. Here's a, a general picture of the main approaches of recommender systems or main techniques. Uh, we will not be able here to, to drill down in each of these topics. Uh, but the main family of recommender systems approach is collaborat collaborative filtering, which means that you take the user's behavior and use them to, to find either users similar to you with similar behavior. And in this example, they, after identifying similar users, they can recommend you items that these similar users like it and probably you, you like. Uh, you have... Uh, approach based on user similarity, based on item similarity. But the main point of collaborative filtering is that it ignores totally the items metadata. And by items, we are talking here in the news portal, the items are news in Netflix, are series or movies, okay? Um, they ignore all metadata. They just user, uses user behavior to, um, to, to guess what's the best recommended items for you. Another important family is content-based filtering. It's, it does not use, uh, it may use some interaction, but it, it uses also metadata of the items. So for example, you, if you saw a movie of a specific actor or director, you may be interested in other movies of the same director or actors, just in a simple example. So they leverage metadata from attributes and users to recommend, okay? And there are the hybrid approaches that try to combine both metadata and user interactions to provide the best recommendations. Talking about collaborative filtering, we have the memory-based techniques that are based on similarity, like uh, nearest neighbors, and they are the model-based techniques that are based on machine learning models. And the most prominent one is matrix factorization. Most uh, recommended systems we use in our daily basis are based on this technique. It was devised uh, during the the, uh, a large competition that that took place in 28 uh, by uh, sponsored by Netflix and the main objective is that as input you have a matrix like this and you have a set of users as rows and a set of columns as items and it's a very sparse matrix which means that uh, for each user of the whole repository of items think in Amazon think how many items or products they are there Maybe you have bought some, uh, a few of them. So just for these positions, you will have a value attribute that buy one and zeros in the most, uh, in the most positions. So it's, they are very sparse. And the objective is which other items you have not bought, you can I recommend? So this is a mathematical model that factors this matrix R into matrix. 
one of users and one focusing on in the items. And you, you can define the number of the features you have for each user and for each item, they must match. And then the objective is that once you've learned these two matrix, when you multiply then you will reconstruct this matrix with some errors. Okay. You need to you wanna minimize those errors in the predictions of whether the user has bought or not our product. And when these use these errors are minimized, you can take the other predictions for items you have not bought or viewed or interacted and get a recommendation from them. So it's a very scalable. It's if you want to try in Spark, there is an implementation of ALS matrix factorization using please feedback and it scales uh, in a Spark cluster. So you may want to take a look. But this is traditional approach. Let's talk here. The objective here is to talk about the recent research about recommender systems uh, using deep learning. Some of them are already in production by major uh, major tech companies like Google, like Pinterest, etc. But most of them is at research time and may be be uh, productive in the uh, in the industry in a few years. Okay, so now let's go a little deeper and talk about why deep learning for recommender systems. Uh, deep learning is all about learning a representation. Okay, using a set of layers and nonlinear transformations so that you can learn hierarchical set of features. And this uh, somehow matches the objective of our recommender systems. For example, you may use uh, feature extraction directly from unstructured data, like images, text, audio. Using deep learning, you can extract those features and use them as metadata for the items that brings information to the model. Uh, you also may mix heter heterogeneous data so you can generate an embedding of an image, combine it with some categorical features, some numerical features, scale them up proper, properly so that the neural network can learn. And it just works using multimodal data. Dynamic behavior with RNNs. So RNNs are great for sequence modeling. And if you're thinking user sessions, they are a sequence of events, and you want to predict what's the next event. So they match perfectly with this objective. Um, they can learn more uh, accurate representation learning generally than the matrix factorization because it, it has more information, especially item metadata. And RexSys is a complex uh, domain, and deep learning has worked well in other complex domain like image classification, object detection. So at least it worth a try in the domain of recommender systems. Here's a brief perspective of how deep learning has been used in the research of RexSys. So there was a seminal paper in 27 using deep boat mach machine for rating prediction, and they showed it could. Uh, would improve a little bit uh, state of art uh, matrix factorization at that time. Then there was a calm before the storm. And then in 2015, there was a few seminal papers on this area, especially on the usage of RNs for, for to, to model session based recommendations. And then in 26, it starts the, the boom. So if you look at the main Rexis conference that is known as uh, uh, ACM, from ACM, ACM Rexis, uh, you will see that a, a large part of the latest papers are trying to explore the usage of deep learning to improve recommendations. The first uh, deep learning recommender system workshop was in 2016. I had the opportunity to be there, to, to have been there, and saw the earliest papers about this team. And then the, the, the interest continues to increase in the last editions. If you, there are lots of papers, but I think we can summarize these approaches in these four, uh, four main approaches using deep learning for RxS. The first one is deep collaborative filtering, that is, use user interactions to, uh, to produce embeddings of users and items and recommend. Learning item embeddings specifically. Feature extraction from the content, especially unstructured data, and session-based recommendations with RNs and their combinations. So most papers are exploring these combina combinations of those approaches. I talk briefly about some of them and deep dive in two cases uh, in, the, in the end of the presentation. So what's an item embedding? An embedding, as you know, is a vectorial represent vector representation 
of an item, ge generally a categorical item. So you think in, uh, in the items of a recommender system, like news or movies, you want to you wanna get a, a numeric representation, a vector of that represents that movie, so that you can compute e easily similarities and, and recommend the items to users. You want that similar entities are similar entities embedded are similar. So if uh, Star Wars 4 and 5 are similar movies, you want their representation, their vectors to be similar also, so that the system can work. They us usually are, are used to initialize items representation and, and also use it in item to item recommendations. So it's a, a key block in any uh, recommender system using deep neural networks. Here's an, ex an interesting example. It was from a paper from Yahoo on 2015, uh, product to vec that mimics the, the idea of word to vec. Okay? So in word to vec, it's a, an algorithm from deep NLP. The main idea is uh, you define a window size and you take, you, you slide over your words of your text and you try and you have two approaches, skip ran and sibo. Here is a skip grand approach that is uh, given a word, predict the words that in the, are in the same context, assuming they are similar, they are uh, semantically related. So uh, the, the sky is blue. Uh, so you can take blue and predict whether sky is in, in the context, right? So the same idea has been applied for recommendations. If you imagine uh, a basket in an e-commerce as a sequence of products that you have added, you may try to predict whether I have, let's say, a specific product in this basket, what's the probability of having other products in, the, in this basket. So uh, this way you can learn a projection or embedding, a representation for this item uh, in which similar items have a similar embedding, okay? So it's the idea of uh, a rhythm from deep NLP applied to um, recommendations. Talking a little bit about feature extraction, right? We have lots of unstructured data. We have images, like it may be a, an image from a news portal talking about a storm. Um, maybe there's an, a hypothesis that this image may add additional uh, knowledge about this content, right? This is a hypothesis. Maybe for Pinterest, for example, where, where the main content is the image, it's worth to extract the, the embedding of the, uh, the, the features of this image, and you can use pre-trained uh, networks like Inception for that, and you get a representation of the, that image and embed, the, embed it into a neural network. Uh, talking about text, we have uh, RANs, we have uh, CANs with one dimension, so you, you, uh, in RANs you are considering the order of the words. When you're using a CNN, you generally define a, a window size and you extract the most relevant features from the text. And then you transform a text with a uh, va variable length in a fi into a fixed length representation that you can use in your neural network. And the same for audio. Uh, RNs and CNNs are being used to, Spotify uses it to, to detect your preference based on which kind of, which style of music you, you have heard. Maybe you, do not do not know about music theory or rhythm or tones, but your pattern reveals that you like something, some kind of music, and this this approach can uh, infer that and use it to recommend uh, unknown users for uh, music for you that you might like. And how do you combine those those information together in a hybrid system? Interaction, user interactions, and item metadata. Generally. Uh, there are three main approaches. You may use item metadata embeddings that you learned previously to initialize items representation. You may use a reg regularization approach, which is you may use item interactions uh, to produce an embedding, use the item metadata as the other embedding and try to maximize the similarity between those. So if they are very different, they may be used as a regularizing term in your loss function. Or you may join, you may just concatenate, let's say, as an example, in Pinterest, you have an image. You may use the image embedding, and uh, they are fixed, they are not training over time. And then you, you devise an, an embedding for the, to, to capture the interactions of the users 
and you let this part of the embedding to be trainable. So you, you, you learn a mixed representation for this item to a specific user. Um, if you want to try uh, a, sp uh, a single model, a, specific, uh, a starter model of deep learning for recommended systems, I would recommend the widened deep learning mo uh, approach. It was published by, by Google in the deep learning workshop. And it's easy to use because Google has made it available easily as a candidate estimator in TensorFlow. So you can easily plug your features, uh, see the results, and run it in a scalable fashion uh, in Google ML Engine. So you can uh, uh, quickly uh, see the performance of your model. How does that work? Basically, it combines a wide model, which is, oh, sorry. A wide model that's basically a linear model, like logistic regression, okay, with a deep model, and uh, they, they are trained together. So the, the error in your prediction, the back propagation, is performed on both networks. So when I heard about this, I, I thought it was a, just a great idea, because according to them, the deep neural network focuses in generalizing, and the linear model focuses in memorization. What does it mean, uh, memorization? Let's say you are building a platform for advertisement, and you want to capture the relationships between the publisher of the advertisement and the, the website where the ad is being displayed. So let's say it's an advertisement about a Nike tennis, and you expect that maybe in a ESPN uh, website, there will be more conversions of this tennis than in other, let's say, uh, a Volga or uh, fashion portal, right? Because uh, of the audience of that that uh, that website. So when we are using linear models, generally you, you combine features, you make feature interaction, so that for categorical features you can uh, have a feature that says, if person, uh, if the ad is about tennis and it's in the ESPN website, the conversion will, will be this. So it kind of memorizes what it sees, whilst the, the deep neural networks, network focus in generalization. So I thought it was a great idea. They reported that their offline results for this model, uh, for apps recommendation, was uh, kind of about the same in offline evaluation. But when they used the A-B test to evaluate, it wa they, they observed an increase over simply the wide model. So I decided to, to give it a try and test in a very large data set. So what I choose the data set of this competition in Kaggle, the outbrain click prediction. The objective was given a set of ads that were shown to the user, rank them so that the, the ad that the user actually clicked is in the first position. So it uses a ranking metric. It was huge because it had 2 billion page views and 70 million click records and more than 500 sites. It, this was a real Kaggle competition. I participated from that competition and uh, was in the 19th position in the end, using simple techniques like linear uh, logistic regression, factorization machines, that's not so sim simple, and then uh, with a simple assembling uh, layer on top of that. And I was, uh, was anxious to see whether the wide and deep model could uh, improve the results, maybe uh, make it uh, less less required to, to do some ensemble and some crazy feature engineering. So I give it a try. This was the database, okay? It's structured database, so what you get? This is the the train data set. You have the display, uh, that is the the session of the user, the, that display of the page, the ad, and for each ad shown in the page, you have the, a label that is clicked on or not, that you want to predict. Obviously, for test set, you don't have the information of which ad was clicked. And then you have some metadata about the document. You have some categories, entities mentioned in this in this document. They refer to art articles, so you have text information there. And also you have information about the user visit, like timestamp, geolocation, etc. Okay. So you have IT information. You have user information about his context. And these features are are of different types. You have numerical features like scalars. You have Temporal features, spatial features, categorical features, and 
the first step is to think how do you prepare those features to input in the, into the model. And TensorFlow, uh, in, in, the, in its higher TFLIRS uh, implementation API, it makes it easy to um, to combine to wire that all those features together. So they provide a can estimator that is called DNN linear combined classifier, which is the wide and deep model. And you provide uh, the set of linear features, okay? The set of uh, deep features or features prepared for for deep neural networks. For example, you you don't want to use item embeddings for linear for linear models, but for for neural networks. So you need to prepare, make some transformation. They are the same features, the same uh, raw features, but they are transformed in a different way according uh, to the model. And you define some other settings here, okay? Uh, here is a, an example of how we wire together the white columns. So for the linear model, we use one hot encoding for, for categ categories, and there are categories here with more than 6,000 va different values. So it leads to a very, very sparse uh, vector for each row of your data set. But there are frames that work really well with this, those sparse representation. While seeing deep columns, for features with low cardinality, you can use one hot encoding. And with higher cardinality, you use embeddings. Okay, So it will learn an embedding, a vector, for each different advertisement, for each different document published etc. for each categor categorical value. And then the results. Uh, here in the first line are one of the models I used in the competition. Uh, it was Walpaul Wabich. It was a linear model that makes it easy to, f to make feature interaction and hashing to reduce the number of the features. And the result of in this, this, this competition metric that was mean average precision, which measures the quality of the ranking. So if from the six ads I put in the first position, they actually click the item, I get total score. In the second position, a lower score for those row, for that row. Uh, this was a score of the, my best model with uh, Volpa Wabich. And then after doing all this, this effort, I could put in, into work the TensorFlow model. And the linear model on TensorFlow was a little, a little bit uh, uh, better than the previous I could get with Volpaul Wabich. I think the Volpaul Wabich model took uh, it, it run just in a single server uh, in about 12 hours and using TensorFlow ML engine, a simple cluster could do that, have that done in six hours of training. We ha I have a deep model also that was trained in about 12 hours. And then the surprise, the deep model was pretty, was well, slow, very, much lower, uh, had a much lower accuracy than the linear model. Then I expected to see the results for a wide and deep model. And I could, couldn't could get uh, the result I could give, could have with linear model. So that teach me a lesson that uh, there's well known that there's no free lunch, but I really expected that either a deep model or a wide and deep model could have, uh, a, could learn a better representation and have a better accuracy. So you, you, as Google report uh, f a few increase, uh, a short increase in the accuracy in offline evaluation, I could observe even worse here. Maybe uh, providing this information to the user with A-B testing, we could have a real picture, but you must be careful when we're applying deep learning. You need to reduce your expectations, is the message here. Okay, so let's, now we are, we are going a little, a little deeper. Um, I will talk a little bit about my research. Um, it's focused on news recommendation using deep learning for recommender systems. Okay. Uh, news recommendation have uh, some different uh, aspects than general recommender systems. You have a very sparse user profiling, which means that each time you enter in a, in a website, if you have not enabled your cookies or if you are using different device, device, the news portal knows about anything about you. And you just read a few of a few note, a few news articles from the whole, the huge data set they have. So they are very sparse. The large, larger publishers like Globe.com have uh, publishes about 1,000 news a day. So it's very dynamic and fast growing. The interest in the information decays very deeply. 
uh, as time passes. So uh, news from the past week doesn't matter any about anything this week. And uh, the user's preference also shift. Now we are all interested in World Cup. Maybe not all of us are interested in football and soccer during uh, continuously, right? So the users shift change. So this was the research objective of the of the my research. Uh, this is like this is how a, a thesis objective looked like. It's a hypothesis or a test in order to improve uh, to achieve a result. So my objective was to investigate, design, and implement a deep learning meta architecture for news recommendation. And by meta, we mean that uh, the architecture may be prepared to change, to change, so that I can change components and compare to improve the accuracy and satisfy information needs. Uh, here is just a picture to show that there are, there are many factors that influence the news relevance for a user. For example, the attributes of the news, like the publisher, the topics, there are dynamic properties also, like the recency of the article, how, how old is, is it, and the pop its popularity. And you have also context information about the user. To this, this chart shows uh, here in the y-axis is the number of clicks in the x-axis is the age of the article. So you see that the peak of the age of the article is when it has it, it's one, one day old. When it starts to get older, the interest in it starts to decrease up to after three days, nobody cares about this news. So we have a very uh, decay, a very high decay in the information value. So uh, you need first to devise when you are building a, a machine learning model. You also need, as in usual software development, devise what are the requirements of the, that model. Because if it does not scale or does not perform well, it will, will not meet the requirements. So the requirement was uh, to work well in extreme code start scenarios when you don't know about anything about the user, to learn in use representation, use deep learning, to use session, user session information of the current session, and if it's available, use information from past sessions, to leverage user's context information like time for news. It's a hypothesis that whether you are in a conference, uh, where you are uh, at home or at work, you may be interested in different content. And also, times of the day also change your interests. So you need to take into account this context information. The dynamic properties of the news, like popularity and recency, we saw that they are important. And uh, another important requirement was that it should be should uh, have online learning. Uh, I would like to, to train in a sample just once so that it scale. I, I don't want to stop each day and run a job with the increasing number of the user interactions and news published and train using past data. I'd like a model where each item is passed once and you have a streaming data uh, being training this model. And finally, it, it should have a model structure. So this is the big picture of the, the main contribution of my thesis. The left side is, is, is focused in to learning item representation of the article. So I want to input text here, like New, New, uh, New York is a multicultural city and some metadata, and want to learn an embedding that will be used for recommendation. And the, the part in the right is focused in recommendations, actually. So in the left part, the objective was, given a text, what's the vectorial representation of it? Uh, here we have a Disney visualization where we see the colors are the categories of the items. So we see that this, uh, this neural network, we use CNNs here in this first trial. We can uh, separate uh, in two dimensions uh, by category. And you see that there are some here. I use a, a German news portal. And you have here some uh, clustered uh, information, uh, news articles about Berlin and about sports. So once you have the pre-trained articles, here are, are the, the posts, they are in German, I don't know any, anything about German, but I know some keywords, and then they, they really talk about Super Bowl, NBA, they really talk about sports, I guess. So the similarities are high. <laughs> um, obviously, Google Translate were, was great for this evaluation also. And then in the second part, we work in the recommendation, actually. Okay. So what's the input of this model? You have a batch. A training batch, and the batch is 
for each line here, you have a user session, okay? So we have this user uh, uh, read five news in each session, this one, uh, two, two, two articles and so on. So what you want to predict? You want to predict the next click of the user. So you take, uh, you know that user has clicked in the first item and the label or expect output is the second item and so on. So I prepare batches this way and throw into a RN, an LSTM to to work on those predictions. Uh, there's a step here of negative sampling. Uh, you cannot compare. Uh, generally, uh, in classification problem, you have a soft max in the end, uh, and you have a fixed uh, number of items. Soft, but in the, as in this case, we are increasingly constantly new items. You cannot do a soft max in the end. So we we need to sample some negative items that the user has not clicked in the session. This is done this way. I take items from the same batch that the user did not click and use it then as negative samples. And in the end, this is the final loss function. Okay, uh, instead of a soft max and cross entropy, what I want to maximize here is the similarity of this learned embedding, okay, with the actual clicked uh, new of the user, actually read new from the user, and minimize the similarity with the negative samples. This way, I'm not limited, you, I can change the number of the items without changing my architecture and without having to retrain the whole data set. This formulation here can be made by a few lines of TensorFlow, they are the same, and in the end I have a loss function which tries to maximize the similarity of the predicted embedding and the actually clicked article embedding. Then comes the evaluation. Um, the, the basic idea is to to run, to train. Uh, my, my protocol was to train up to this hour the, the model and then try to predict what will be the next clicks in the next hour for the sessions. So I use ranking metrics, recall three, that verifies that w within the sample of the items, they are in the top three, and NBCG takes the actual position into account. And then I benchmark with very, very popular algorithm, but with no machine learning here that um, are commonly used in news portal. Like uh, within the, the most recent clicks, what was the most popular uh, news is the popular recent. Co-occurrent is basically uh, uh, market basket. So for each item, for each article, which other articles are, seen to, are read together in the same session and content based just similarity of the content. Then after some, some weeks working in TensorFlow, I was like this guy really excited about what would be the results. But after the results, I, I was like this. <laughs> There's no case tool to transform your PowerPoint, your model into TensorFlow. It was a hard work, but the results were like this. So the blue line here is the model, okay? Here you have the recall metric. And you see that most of the time, the recall is a little better than, here in the x-axis is the actual, uh, there, there it was, I use it at date set with 30 days, okay? So here are the days. Um, I expected uh, a larger difference, but I could get uh, just a small one in this first trial. Is another metric, NDCG. And here you can see better the distribution. Here's my model. It's 4% better than the baselines that those doesn't use your machine learning at all. <laughs> so uh, let's let's go back to the to the to the model, rethink something, and I have some trials to do. But uh, it's common in machine learning models that there are very hard baselines that you you will strive to beat. Uh, but uh, as you increase in the accuracy, it gets harder and harder to to improve. Here is a the blue line is the is my model. So here you have the 24 hours of the day. The hypothesis here was: uh, is that that my model performs better? in the morning, in the evening, you can see it performs a, a shortly better throughout the day or throughout the 30 days of training, okay? So next steps in, in this research specifically for the ACR model is to try different word embeddings. I use pre-trained uh, word to vec On Wikipedia, I, I will try GLUV. Try different feature structures like RNs to extract features from text. And in the recommendations model, there are lots of things to do, like test, test different RNs, different negative sampling techniques, leverage past sessions of the user to initialize uh, for newer sessions, 
evaluate and larger data sets. We've uh, worked in a partnership with Globo.com, and we will work on a five-month data set, and it's huge. I'm anxious to, uh, to, to see the results. And hyper-tunings, uh, hyper-parameter tunings. I will leave you with two main references. This one was a workshop of the author of the, the first paper of RNNs for sequences, for session-based. Uh, it's a very good material. Um, I, I did not touch uh, deep matrix factorization here, but here's a, a lab that was made by Lo Mopatel in Strata Conference. It's worth uh, lots of sample code, how to implement that. Um, I also will leave you a sh uh, share with you a data set we've made available at CNT for you. There are lots of user interactions and articles there. Uh, it's from an internal user platform. And there you can uh, try on your, uh, we have some kernels we've prepared of, as the first steps in recommender systems using Python, okay? And that's it. The last notice is that we are hiring. We, we work with NLP, with computer vision. Here's a, a link you can apply, or you can just drop me an email. We, we will be happy to talk with you. Thank you.